All right, so we are continuing in Revelation chapter 6. Let me just flip through the here and see exactly what the plan and what we did yesterday. Um, all right, so if you weren't present, we went through uh, the New Testament, Matthew and Luke, and we looked at how well Christ talked about uh, the signs that were going to come in the last days. What will the end days be like? And he talked about false Christ, deceivers, Many will come in his name, things like that. He talked about there'll be wars and famines and death and martyrs and global chaos. That's all kind of laid out in Matthew chapter 24 and in Luke chapter 21. Well, lo and behold, when we get to Revelation, the prophecy that Christ said, it's how it unfolds, right? It unfolds with the, um, with the first seal breaking. And the one that comes forth is uh, on a white horse, right? And comes just like how Christ comes, right? And then then comes a red horse, which represents war. Well, that's what Matthew said and Luke said. Christ, That's what Christ said in Matthew and Luke. And then after that comes famines, right? And that's the pale horse, I believe. No, no, that's the black horse, right? And then uh, comes death, and that's the pale horse. And that's just how um, Christ laid it out. And then it goes on and talks about the, you know, brother against brother and um, things like that, how the, you'll be martyrs, martyrs for Christ. Um, speaking of, you know, the nation of Israel particular, in particular, right? And that's what happens as we go through the scrolls. The fifth scroll is, um, there's going to be those that are going to be martyred. They're going to be saying, how long, O Lord, will, you know, will you not revenge us, stuff like that. They're under the altar. All this stuff, it just unfolds just the way Jesus prophesied it in Matthew and Luke, right? Um Yeah, I'm not going to go back through that. I'm just giving you some highlights here, right? But one of the things that we looked at in Luke 21 was that uh, Christ talked about that when we know that the things are near, we said, Christ said that in uh, Luke chapter 21, verse 8, take heed that ye be not deceived, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and the time draweth near. So then that's when you know that the time is drawing near, when there's many deceivers, many that have had the Antichrist spirit is, the, is a deceiver. Right, Luke. I mean, uh, the letter of John. John's letters talked about uh, deceivers. That the Antichrist is the deceiver. Right. So oh, there's lots of deception going on in the world, more and more and more, as we are aware of. That we know that the time draweth near, and so this is a great sign that we see all this deception, politics and media and everywhere. It's just people just deceived. We know that the time is near. All right. Um, I'm going to end with that. So we opened. We looked at the first seal. Uh, the white horse, the bow, and the crown. And then we're going to go through the rest of the one through the first seal through the fourth seal. That's what we're going to do today. And then we're going to stop and then we'll start from the fifth seal and everything else. All right. So. I don't need that. All right. So just the um, uh, a quick recap of the first seal, which is the white horse. Right. Um, Whenever the seal, the first four seals are open, we discuss how there's a beast that says, come and see. Uh, and the unique thing about it is that each of the four beasts that are associated that speak about the four seals, it gives us, uh, it says that one of the beasts does. And the first beast that's associated with the first seal that's opening up is the lion. Now, I'm not, I was kind of discussing this yesterday about, you know, I'm not quite sure that there is a, a correlation between the two because we know the beast is a symbol of, is a, is a, represents Christ and its different manifestations, right? And the four beasts go with the first four seals. And that first beast that speaks is the lion. I'll tell you how I know that the first beast that speaks is a lion, because it says in the second beast, right? Um, but we know who the beasts are in order, because it says it in Revelation chapter 4, verse 7. It says the first beast was like the lion. The second beast was like a calf or an ox. The third beast is as a face had the face of a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. So these are the beasts that, whenever the seals are open, they begin to uh, say, "Come and see," you know, what this next horse is coming is is coming, right? As each seal is the first four seals are opened up. So I do believe that there is some kind of correlation there. I don't think this is meant to be random because after that, after the four seals are broken, the beasts don't comment anymore as the seals are opened up like that. So I'm like, there's gotta be some correlation to it, but I haven't quite put it together. If uh, Pastor Ballard in her studies 
scholarly studies have already come to terms with that. She's more than welcome uh, to kind of chime in with that. I'm just now going back and adding that. I didn't have, I don't have a complete in this of understanding of that. So it's kind of like, eh, let me just not leave, I won't put that in there, but I'll add it in there just for those who may also have some insight or may get a revelation of that and, and can add to that. But I will say that there is somewhat so much of a correlation that this first white horse that is released, we're in uh, Revelation chapter six, verse two now, that this white horse and him that sat on it, we talked about, that is representative of like the antichrist when he comes. Uh, like Christ comes, he comes on a white horse. He comes with crowns as well. He comes with power, right? Um, this white horse is almost representing, seems like it's representing the antichrist. That when he comes, he's sitting on this white horse. We said the white horse is like symbol of power and majesty and victory, right? Just as how Christ comes, right? Um, comes on the white horse as well. Um, and then we noticed that how he said that him that sat on it had a bow, right? And I was letting you know that this bow is not like the bow that we're thinking about, like a bow and arrow, right? When you look it up in, in the uh, in strong concordance, it has this phrase that says a simple fabric, you know, like what? But as you continue to do study, study on this, it um, it's like it's some kind of banner, but that word bow itself means just basically just meant bent. When you go back and you continue to dig deeper into it, the bow is talking about that is bent. It means something that is bent. And uh, the root word of it is like toxin, right? And toxin, of course, is like uh, a, a weapon, like an arrow that has a, a poison tip on it. Uh, that's another context of what the word bow means when you look up from its Greek word meaning uh, toxin. I'm just looking at one of the lines here under this, under the topic bow that I have here. Right. But the other word that this goes back to is the word rainbow, right? But instead of saying rainbow, use the word bow like that. But it's not talking about a bow and arrow. The same word that is used in the Greek is, has its origins in the Hebrew when you go back and research that. And it goes with the sentence that's in Genesis chapter 9, verse 13, where it says, I, set my, I will set my bow in the sky, talking about the rainbow covenant uh, with Noah. And so I believe that when you look at this all together, that this bow that is talking about that this uh, that this hymn that is riding on the white horse has a bow, I believe it is a bow that represents like a rainbow or he comes with a covenant. When he comes, he brings forth a covenant, a covenant of peace, right? Uh, and that's so when he, I believe this is speaking of the Antichrist, that when he comes, he comes with this bow or this covenant of like, I'm coming to bring peace, coming to bring a covenant, I'm going to bring peace to the world, right? That's how he comes, by peace. He brings peace to uh, the world, Gentile world. He brings even peace to the nation of Israel. He just brings peace to everybody. Of course, we know he's going to break that covenant, right? Um, uh, and then, of course, he has this crown we talked about that is given to him. And we talked about given to him being both that God allows it. Uh, that God allows him to, ever to, to be able to conquer like this. Uh, to be able to reign like that as well, but also this crown talking about that is given to him as if when he rises on the scene, this Antichrist, when he rises on the scene, people just bow down to him. They give it to him. They make him ruler and Lord. They just submit to him. And we know that's already happening. They're looking, the world is looking for this Messiah to come. And as soon as he comes on the scene, we see previous ones that come up. The world is just like going crazy. They just flock to him and bow down to him. They're ready to just give this, oh, this is the one that's going to bring peace and, you know, uh, and salvation to the world, right? Uh, and so I believe this is kind of what this is speaking of, that the crown is given to him, right? That the world just makes him like, you know, he's the man of peace. He's the, the Messiah. He knows all. He, you know, uh, you know, uh, just like how when Christ, how when Christ is going to come, he's going to come on a white horse as well. He's going to bring peace, but the peace that he's going to bring is going to come at the end of a sword, right? But this man, he also is going to come uh, who's writing on it doesn't clearly identify who this individual is that's riding on it just says that riding on this white horse it just says him the only one that actually gives a name to the person that's riding on the white horse is the one that's riding on the on the pale horse I believe it, the one that is named death and hell follows him it tells him what the name is of the person that is he that is sitting on the horse but here all the others it doesn't it just says he is remain nameless but I think many of us feel that like this represents the Antichrist when he arises on the scene. 
right? And then he goes forth to goes forth conquering and to conquer, right? And that's where we kind of left off that last thing I talked about. So he starts out as a man of peace. And so I believe that's what that bow represents, man of peace, establish a covenant, like a rainbow covenant, right? Um, I would even, I was even speculating as far as I put some side notes in here. It was like, I probably shouldn't have put it in there, but I was like, hmm, let me back up. Uh, I put in here like he, this bow that is represented above him represents a symbol of peace and unity. And I put in, uh, in parentheses, if you read the here, I put LGBTQA plus is even more than that though. Um, like, ooh, they have the symbol of unity, like a rainbow as well. It's a banner that, that they fly. They have their little pride uh, rainbow flag thing, right? It's supposed to be a symbol of unity and peace or whatever. I was like, hmm, I'm not saying that that's what that is. I'm just saying, you know, like the Antichrist is going to have this, is going to have a, a symbol. He's going to bring forth something that is going to be like a banner in which he's going to bring the whole world together under and bring peace, right? To make covenants with everyone, with the whole world, bring the whole world into a place of covenant of peace. But he starts out as a man of peace, we see, right? He's given to him. Um, but then he's going to go forth um, conquering. He conquers first by peace. That's how he brings everyone in. He starts out as a man of peace, and that's how he conquers first by peace. Uh, but then once he begins to conquer, he conquers, right? Then he goes forth later to be a man of war, destroying many. So his ultimate, so uh, when I'm talking about what this bow is referring to, and this crown is given to him, that's how he conquers. He is crowned king. Um, and he makes peace, and that's how he, he goes forth conquering, right? But then it says, and to conquer, which means that there's two parts, by peace and by his royalty, and I guess he really comes off as some kind of great, wise, royal, you know, eloquent, kingly kind of an individual that it, he conquers, he is able to go forth and conquering by that method. Uh, but then it says, and to conquer, which means he starts out as a man of peace, conquering first by peace, but then later becomes a man of war, destroying many. So his ultimate and sole purpose is to conquer absolutely. That means by by might, by military force, by power, and it's done mightily. All right, so he goes forth conquering, but ultimately it's like, I'm going to conquer everyone by military might and power and dominance, right? That's what it's kind of talked about, went forth conquering and to conquer, right? Not just people submitting to him by peace, but also then ultimately by force, by demanding it through military might and power and violence, right? I'm going to move this down. Probably going to be in the way again. All right, so then this is where we left off at. And now the third seal says, and when he had opened the second seal, and I heard the second beast say, come and see. So that's how we know that the first beast that spoke was the lion, right? It was the lion. And in that sense, I was like, well, maybe that does kind of be like a representative of how when Christ comes, Christ comes like a lion, like the tribe of the, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And that speaks of him coming in like a warlike, a lion is one that conquers uh, through, you know, violence, he overtakes, you know, like that. And just, oh. And, uh, and the king is like, uh, lion is like the king, we call it like the king of the jungle, but he is the top of the predators, as we would say, right? And none can stand before him or anything like that or overpower him, right? Uh, and I see that symbolism associated with the first beast and the lion of the tribe of Judah with the first uh, seal open and this white horse coming down, like, hmm, maybe there is something, there's correlation between uh, each of the beasts that speak and the first four seals as well. But this is all conjecture, but I'm just putting it out here for you guys. Uh, and then the fourth beast thing stops after the fourth seal. So I'm like, hmm, maybe there's something there. But here we see when the when he had opened the second seal, this is Christ opened the second seal, he heard the second beast say, come and see. Right. So the second beast we know then is the ox or the calf, right, or the, you know, or the lamb, some, well, yeah, like that. But it says the ox or a calf, or we also put in there, we've seen scripture where it says the lamb, right? And so I'm like, hmm, maybe this has something to do with this fourth seal as it relates to this fourth, the second horseman that's going to be coming. But anyway, we know that the second beast is the ox or calf. When we go back to Revelation chapter four, verse seven, it says, and the first beast was like a lion and the second beast was like a calf. The third beast had the, third beast had the face of a, as a man, and the fourth beast, fourth beast was like a flying eagle, right? So 
uh, that's how we know that the second um, beast is the calf or the ox like that or, or, or the lamb, okay? Uh, so the beast says, come and see. So John goes and he looks, right? And the verse, verse four, it says, it says, and there went out another horse that was red and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth and they should kill one another and there was given unto him a great sword. So uh, the, the second beast says, come and see, which is uh, the ox or the calf, right? Um, and so when I think of that, I'm thinking about, okay, well, that's, you know, slain. You know, that lamb or that ox was, or that calf was taken, he was slain by, uh, by the Gentiles, murdered, slaughtered violently, right? That's what the scripture talks about. How he was uh, led as a sheep, uh, as a lamb to the slaughter, stuff like that. Just killed violently, inhumanely, right? Murdered, right? So here we see the red horse coming out, and he's given uh, power to to take a uh, piece from the earth that everyone should kill one another. So it's like blood for blood. It's almost like you know, uh, uh, the lamb was slain, the calf was slain, and slaughtered and murdered. And so now here comes the 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 red horse coming out, which is given power to take peace from the earth and cause people to just murder and kill each other blood for blood, right? The sword is given, a great sword, right? So red is typically associated with terror and death, right? Uh, scriptures, when we talk about this, this red horse and the color red, that speaks of great and bloody slaughter by violence and war, right? Uh, it speaks of things that are red in, in the Bible we refer, and that related to violence. We talk about the red dragon. We talked about this before, that when we talk about the dragon being red or the dragon in, in, in general talks about violence, the Satan doing things with violence, bloody violence, terrible violence, right? We talk about the red beast in the, in the book of Revelation we're going to see. When we talk about the red beast, it's talking about the beast that murders, kills the blood of the saints, right? Just, just blood, murder, violence, engages in all types of violence, taking the souls of men and things like that, right? So we see that clearly when we talk, see the red, we kind of already have an idea of what, what it's talking about, lots of violence. So it makes sense that uh, power was given to him to take peace from earth, that they should kill one another, right? And it was given to him a great sword. Um, the Antichrist comes bringing peace, but then later we see that peace is taken away Right, and then there is nothing but just pure violence that that occurs after the Antichrist comes. So he comes and brings peace and, and brings a covenant, but then soon after that, then violence just ensues when this red horse comes and him that sits on on the red horse. Again, we don't know who is the is the him that sits thereon. It doesn't give us that, but we know that this person is given power to take away peace from the earth. Now it says, "Take peace that they should kill one another." Now this taking peace away that they should kill one another. That involves all kinds of battles, assassinations, rebellions. That's all kinds of lynching and every other kind of violence. That's rebellion, revolt, massacres. That's even brother against brother. I mean, it's just pure, just violence just unleashed upon the earth. Right? They should, everybody should just kill one another. There's no, it's to the point where there's like complete madness. When you read uh, Ezekiel chapter 38, Verse 21, it talks about how brother against brother, it's just, everybody's going to be just fighting each other. Right? There'll be no peace on earth, right? Christ, he came and he died so that there would be peace, so that man's hearts would be uh, purged of sin and iniquity and violence, stuff like that. But now that they've rejected that, now um, that violence has now turned to them, right, in this full measure. In Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 15 through 33, it describes it as a time of complete madness. Like there was madness. You know, sometimes I like actually watching um, post-apocalyptic movies for some reason. Um, and I just see how the descriptions, how they're describing just this widespread, just violence. And with that comes just desolation uh, in the world. I'm like, and so they're just prophesying the things that are basically that will that are going to come. This great madness. When scriptures talks about, and there was given to him a great sword, that that great sword is just it describes the extent and the depth of the bloodbath that is going to be occurring. Like a great sword. There's going to be just great uh, extent of death, 
the extent and depth of the amount of blood that's going to be shed and the violence that's going to be going on uh, is uncomparable to anything that we've ever saw. And we've known that there's been great violence and, mur and wars and stuff like that. But whatever we're going to be seeing here, nothing's going to be like it. People are just going to be just killing each other left and right. And of course, the Antichrist is going to play a role in that violence as well. He's going to be a man of war as well. He's going to be engaging in violence and war as well. Right. So all that together, not only Antichrist, but everybody's going to be just engaging in war and killing and murdering each other. Right. Uh, it goes on in verse uh, five. It says, and he and when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, come and see. All right. So we know who. So when the third seal opened again, then we know then that there is the third beast. Right. And we know the third beast represents the face of a man. Again, I have not put together the revelation or insight yet, although I hadn't really started praying about it. But I will for the next time we come through, we'll pray about it to see the, you know, the correlation of why they specify the third beast, the first beast, the second beast like that, so that we can get a, a better insight. It has to relate to something about Christ, right? Uh, what, what Christ did. Uh, and now what's happening to them as a result of what Christ did or went through. Uh, and now that judgment is coming back up, upon, upon them. But I don't have it. I don't quite fully have it yet. But I haven't started to pray about that to get that insight and revelation. Uh, so the third seal opens up. And then the, the third beast, which is the, like the face of a man or as has the face of a man. Right. He says, come and see. And then behold, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. So when the third seal opens up, the black horse uh, is let loose. Right? Now we know black is a symbol of famine. You can go back and look uh, in the Old Testament. It talks about in the book of Lamentations, chapter 4, verse 4 through 8. He has, talks about where there's all kind of famine goes on. It begins to describe what famine looks like uh, amongst the people. And it talks about how their visage is blacker than coal, how their skin cleaveth to their bone. But it gives a description of like famine being associated with blackness, right? Uh, you know, their visage is blacker than coal. That's pretty black, right? And Jeremiah talks about um, prophecies are talking about the famine that was going to come and begins to talk about that, how they were black to the ground. Like their appearance and everything was like black. Like they were like dirt, just like, I don't know how, why the scriptures kind of describes, I guess I haven't seen true famine, I guess. <laughs> the famine that they're talking about. Describes that this famine is described like the, the famine associated with like, without having water, you know, uh, in the absence of water, the appearance that you have is like this blackness that occurs, right? Um, but yeah, but it describes this in Jeremiah chapter 14. I read it just like, boy, that is quite odd how blackness is associated with the appearance of someone, right, as the face of a man. And so I'm just wondering if this, the third beast on the face of a man is something associated with, um, uh, with this black horse and the appearance and the visage of how man looks, right, during a time of famine that has something to do with this third beast uh, having a, a face as of a man, right? But anyway, uh, there's again, there's someone that is sitting on it, but it's not identified who this person is that is sitting on it, right? But it has a pair of balances in his hand, right? So we know the pair of balances is basically saying that it's speaking of great scarcity, right? And so that you have to... Um, eat your bread by weight and drink your water by measure, right? So you're just not able to just eat as much as you want, stuff like that. You, there, you're only given enough to survive, right? Based on your weight, based on your height, you're only given enough to just thrive. I won't even say thrive. You're just given enough to survive, right? That's just how bad it's going to be, right? Um, and then he says, goes on in verse six, says, and I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny. And see, thou hurt not the oil and the wine. All right, so many of us have already gone through and done all these measurements and things like that. So I don't have to go through it. But I think you know, I have to check with Pastor Ballard to see if our uh, calculations and things measure up. I should have gone and checked with some of the other scholars that are out there uh, as well, because they've already done these same measurements as well. But basically, it's from what I've been able to understand as an estimate that basically um, they, each person is for the measure of wheat that they're talking about. It's like 1.8 loaves of bread, right, or a pound of bread. 
And that's supposed to be like a, a daily supply for one person. And I think it's probably talking about a measure of a man though, right? That this is how much that they, they're gonna get. And basically it's gonna cost them in order for to get this is basically a whole day's work. So you work a whole day and all you're going to get is basically is a loaf of bread, right? And that's just going to be enough for you to be able to survive and thrive off just for just just for that day. So it just talks about that there's going to be complete economic collapse going on. Whenever you when things are being measured out like this, there is complete collapse of economies and governments and systems, right? Because whenever you famines take place, it's in, it takes place in the presence of like complete loss of government systems, organized systems, uh, distribution systems. All of that stuff has been completely disrupted. Um, of course, in the in the face of like violence that's going on, everybody killing and murdering themselves, there's complete there's complete chaos everywhere, right? And so now has been brought in just complete famine, and famine always tend, has a tendency to follow war as well. And so whenever there is widespread war and violence that the red horse brings, typically that is always followed with famine in the natural sense as we have seen. But if this is also in addition to that though, this is also spiritual. Um, uh, attacks coming up upon the earth to cause these things to happen, to cause war to happen, to cause famine to happen as well, right? And then it makes this uh, this side note, it says, see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Now, uh, many say that this is talking about that uh, the natural oil, right, uh, and wine, like grapes and stuff like that. Uh, but I don't believe that this is talking about that. I believe that in the face of famine, what is being said here, see that thou heard not. One of the four, one, a voice is heard in the midst of the, of the four beasts says, see thou heard not the oil and the wine. And I believe that this is talking about um, the oil and the wine represents the, the consecrated Jews, right? The oil represents the consecrated Jews. And basically what it's saying is that the Jews will have provisions. Although there's going to be a great famine, right? Uh, provisions will be provided for the consecrated Jews, right? The Jews are going to, are going to turn to Christ, um, and provisions are going to be provided for them. They're not going to be hurt. They're going to be able to have sustenance to be maintained throughout this tribulation period that's going on. Now, that's my um, personal view. Uh, you can take it as conjecture because I can't at this point. Um, I'd have to do some more research to to provide the scriptures that that show you that this is actually talking about. Um, provisions uh, for the Jews, not hurting the oil and the wine, make sure that they do not go into this type of famine like that as well. I have to do more research on that. I came to that at some point, and I just don't have the scriptures that take the time to put the scriptures down to kind of support that. Right. Um, verse, verse seven says, and when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, come and see. All right, so now we're down to the fourth seal. When the fourth seal pops, Right or <laughs> or just like me saying pop when the fourth seal is released off the scroll, right? The fourth beast is associated with the flying eagle, right? So I don't again, I don't know the correlation between the fourth beast and the release of the fourth seal. But when the fourth seal is released, right? Uh, he says, and I looked and behold a pale horse, and a name is, and his name that set on him is death. So he looks and he sees this pale horse. And so the pale horse, when you look up what that word pale is talking about, is actually talking about, it comes from the root word chloral. So it's actually, it's a ghastly green. Uh, I don't know if you guys have ever seen chlorine gas. It's actually, it's a green uh, 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 gas. It comes, the word chloros comes from our root word that we use in English, chlorine. Uh, and it means green, but it's also the color of leprosy as well. You didn't know that, <laughs> you know, as a side note. Um, so this pale horse is not actually talking about pale like we think pale, like, um, uh, I was gonna make a little joke about uh, Indian saying, um, <laughs> the, uh, anyway, um, it's not talking about that kind of pale, like someone that needs to get a tan or something like that. It's a pale that's associated with some kind of like green, greenish color, right? Uh, which kind of, goes along with, you know, with death, right? His name, and the person that sat on him uh, was called death. So this is the only individual that says what his name is. The rest of them just say he that sat thereon, right? It doesn't give the name, but when it comes to the pale horse, it actually tells us 
who what's the name of the person that's actually sitting on the horse and the name of the one that is sitting on the horse his name was death right and death is describing here as an individual but it is all it is a demon so death is actually a, a demon right uh, and, and Paul talks about having overcome death right and one of the, the one of the deaths that he's talking about is uh, is the demon death that is able to reign in the presence of sin and how Christ has overcome death right and when he's, oh, by overcoming death we overcome the the physical death as the result of being in sin we are we are spared from that uh, through Christ's victory on the cross but here we see this death is an actual demon that is here riding on this horse that has been released on on earth and it says that his uh, and his name that sat on him was death and hell followed with him so we have death and then we have hell that followed with him so death claims the body and then hell comes and claims the soul so that's what he's doing he is destroying the body and then the soul boy, he's casting it straight into hell because so these are individuals that are in sin living in sin, walking in sin, won't repent of their sins. All this stuff is going on, and these are individuals that will not repent. So then death is allowed, this demon is allowed to come and find those who are in sin who will not repent uh, at, at, the, at all of the judgments that are being poured out, and he's allowed to go in there, and he's allowed to claim them, kill them, kill their body, and then take their soul, boop, and then toss it right into hell, or Hades, as, as, as we would say. All right, so death is able to claim its prey by several means, and this is what it's described. And power was given unto unto them, and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword, to kill with hunger, and with death and with beasts. So um the all the different horses, the the white horse, the red horse, the black horse, the pale horses, as that power was given unto them. That them, right, uh, could be referring to um, death and hell. I'm not really sure. Is that the them? Or is the them that has been referred to as all of those other four horses? They're able to come and they're able to kill with the fourth part of the earth, to kill with the sword, to kill with hunger, and to kill with death. Uh, the sword is that red horse. Uh, the hunger is the black horse, right? Um, and death is the... Is there, is there another? This was a, am I missing a horse here? A white horse. Uh, the red horse is the sword. The black horse is hunger, and the green horse is the is death, right? Or the pale horse. <laughs> the pale horse is death. So that was given to them to go to the fourth part of the earth, um, uh, and to kill. And it says, and with beasts. Right, so they were to kill with death and with and with with beasts. So the and with death, when it talks about and with death, talking about the pale horse that is able to kill, he's able to kill with death as well. Right. He also involves death involving the beasts of the earth. Now, this beast that that is being mostly when we think of beasts, we think about just like big animals, like lions, bears, tigers you know, wildebeest or something like that. Um, but in the Old Testament, when the Bible talks about beasts, it doesn't just limit it to like animals that are four-footed beasts that crawl around. It also talks about uh, beasts as being pestilence, right? It talks about death, including, it talks about uh, uh, and killing with death and with beasts of the earth. It includes pestilence. Uh, in Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 21, the scripture talks about how the Lord is going to send his four sore, S-O-R-E, sore judgments. I'm just reading this line in the, in the bottom here, right? Uh, and it says sword, famine, noisome beast, and pestilence, right? So part of this death, and that's, that is talking about in Revelation chapter 6, verse 8, that says that um, power was given unto them. Right, those four horsemen to kill. Uh, uh, it was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword, with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. That death that they're talking about, that death includes uh, noisome beasts, includes pestilence, and includes animals. So when the Lord was speaking in Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 21, he's going to send his 
four, sword judgment of sword, famine, and noisome beasts. Uh, and I think Pastor Ballard has broken down that what a noisome beast is, is those things come with like um, uh, pestilence, uh, all types of uh, sores, all types of uh, bacterial, or microbial, or viral infections and stuff like that, as well as all types of pestilence, right? So when it's talking about, talks about death, this death that it that is talking about also is really including pestilence. It's not talking about just like animals, four beasts of animals, including uh, pestilence and things like that, all kinds of like um, diseases that may come about through all kinds of viruses, uh, bacteria and things like that as well, and begin to affect the body causing death. So that's what it's talking about in Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 21, uh, the four sword judgment, sword, famine, noisome beast and pestilence. That's the death. When I just kind of run, put those scriptures together like that, you see that correlation that that death is what it's talking about here. It's talking about the inclusion of beast and pestilence, as well as, as the death that comes from the pale horse, you know, killing as well, and then tossing them in, into hell as well. All right, I think this is where I am going to stop right here. I know it's a little early. Uh, we're going to pause right here. I don't want to get into the fifth seal, but any comments or questions that anyone uh, has here?